Hi, welcome to the signal path or the noise path, depending on how long this video would eventually be. We're going to try and repair this Keithley 2001 multimeter. This is a seven and a half digit meter built in the early 90s. And these are still highly sought after units because of their performance and of course seven and a half digit resolution there. Now I tried to repair one of these many, many years ago and I couldn't do it. I, this, was on, this was not on camera and I gave up because it was just too much damage. Now these have a very common failure mode. So if you have one of these and you're trying to repair it, do not turn it on, although somebody probably already did. But what happens is that the capacitors on the power supply is leak and they leak onto some of the traces on the primary analog PCB. They eat them away. When you turn it on, those power supplies do not regulate and they go into some very high voltages, destroying a cascade failure of many, many things in a row. That's why I couldn't fix the last one. I suspect this probably has a similar issue, but nonetheless, we didn't have that one on camera, so we're going to try this one. Even if we can't fix it, it's thanks to the Patreon support that I can bring these kind of repairs to you, even if they would be failures. So let's give it a try. So because this instrument has a fan over here and there's a lot of sensitive analog circuits that you want to keep the temperature constant, there's a cover over here. allows the airflow to go from the side here and out the fan without disturbing everything that's underneath it. Now I have removed this and I worry that someone's already been in here, but I'll show you why I think that. And here is the main analog board. We can see the converter here in the front on a separate board and a whole bunch of beautiful analog design as to be expected from Keithley. Now, just as I suspected earlier, look at that. The same problem. You see that? Over here, these are these capacitors that are leaking onto these traces. And these are part of the primary power supply. And once this happens, it means those traces could be damaged. And if it's the same problem, someone's turned it on, yeah, it might be hopeless. But nonetheless, we're going to try, first thing first, remove this whole board, disassemble, remove all these capacitors and replace them before we can do anything else. And then we can figure out if it powers on and see what it does. And the reason I think someone's been in here is because the clips of this ferrite core are broken. And also, if you look at these pins of the front rear switch, they're bent in. And this is in the way of that black cover I showed you. So if you don't know how to put that black cover back and you're just hastily pushing it into place, you will damage those pins. And I also noticed a couple of these components were bent and I had to straighten them out when I opened it. I think someone basically opened it up, took a look, didn't see anything obviously wrong with it, and they just jammed it back together and that's what caused the damage, I think. But anyway, I don't think these are, this is a problem. I, I, can, I can take this one from the old board and replace it. I think we do need to replace it because these bands seem to have seized this switch so I can't really even press it anymore. So anyway, it's got a lot of work to do. So I went ahead and removed all the capacitors and every single one of them has leaked and damaged the PCB. It's really quite consistent and the damage is significant. I mean, all these traces have been, are now bad. I have to look and see how I can repair them. And this is why these power supplies go haywire. Now, these are not bad capacitors. These are Nichicon capacitors, all of them. So this is not something that Keatley, for example, didn't want to spend money on. I wonder if they got a bad batch of these in the early 90s, and that's why all of them have failed. So if you have one of these units and it's working, believe me, this is happening to your unit. If it's from the early 90s, you better go and recap it. Otherwise, this is what you're going to find eventually. And this is bad because once the electricity is running and the fluid is out of the capacitors, it eats away from the traces. And that's, the, that's why the problem is so exaggerated, because it runs over time. So anyway, I'm going to clean up the board and see what damage is. So this is a multi-layer board, and unfortunately the damage has caused some holes in the PCB where those capacitors were. So let's take a couple of x-rays of it and see what internal traces should still be connected. So let's take a look and see what we have here. So keep in mind that in an x-ray, the white areas is the area where x-ray is being absorbed and the dark areas is where there's essentially a hole or where x-ray goes right through. So these dark areas are the holes of the capacitors where they used to be, they're removed of course. And this is a four or six layer board, I can't quite remember, but it's very fragile. And if you look at around where this capacitor used to be, the damage is extensive. You can basically almost see through the PCB, but luckily in this region, there aren't too many traces and this connection still seems to be maintained to whatever is left over this pad. And to fix this, you have to push wires through these because the vias are almost always destroyed. You have to make sure that they're making contact. It's a very tedious work. You can also see that this trace over here ends here, but in reality, it's supposed to continue on and actually makes a contact to this. This is a diode over here. And this trace here is broken. You can see it's supposed to connect to this. It's not connected. This is a via going down, and I can see this from the edge of this hole with the naked eye. This is a via going to the top. That's why the reason it's wider is because there's solder on top of it. So it's absorbing more of the x-ray. This is a bit fuzzy. That's because I had some setting in the x-ray machine I should have turned off, but I, I forgot to do it. But it's okay. Nonetheless, I took a few more x-rays so we can examine them. And these are obviously our power lines. That's why they're so much thicker than these thinner lines here. 
This is a full bridge rectifier. You can see right through it. This actually has the four diodes very clearly inside. That's a heat sink, obviously. Some ICs, you can see the internal ICs. That's a capacitor that's kind of hanging onto the side, the ceramic capacitor. That's why its shadow looks a little bit strange you know, on X-ray. But yeah, so I, this is an iterative work. You have to go through it, look one at a time, and eventually figure it out. I just wanted to show you what my process is here. All right, so let me explain the ordeal that I had to go through to get this working. So guided by X-ray, I did put all the capacitors back. And I, there's a lot of little tiny wires that are going underneath the capacitors, which you can't see because the caps are already on top. And I try to make sure that all the connections are remade. The next step is to look at all the diodes that are around these capacitor areas. So it looks like that at some point, the revision of this board changed and they added some protection diodes around the capacitors so that if something goes wrong, it doesn't kill everything. So that gives me a little bit of hope. If you look at the previous version of this board that I worked on many, many years ago, if you look carefully, for example, you can see that there are no diodes between these capacitors and you can see this one had different kind of problems, different places were broken. There are no diodes here, here, or here, or here. But if you look at this one, there are indeed diodes sitting between various capacitors. You can see these diodes over here, this one over here, and this one over here. Now, many of them were actually bad because the capacitors had died and everything basically was either short-circuited together or some places they were open and very large voltages were showing up. So all of these uh, diodes had to be, essentially most of them had to be replaced, which I already did. There are versions of that diode on this board, so I basically used this board as a donor board and I kept grabbing components from it until I repopulated this one with all the ones that it had broken. Now, if you're going to change the capacitors of this, you cannot stop at the analog board. The digital board capacitors were also all bad, and they had eaten into the traces of the digital board too, so that also had to be repaired as well. The digital board that I have from the previous version of this instrument is actually a little bit different. This is a 1990 revision. This is 1992. The EPROM is in two different odd and even bit uh, UV erasable chips there. Otherwise, this looks okay. There's really not much of a difference aside from that. There's a power supply here that's a little bit different than that one. There's no longer a module. Everything is just a little bit upgraded. So this also had to have quite a bit of work done on it. I also noticed that a couple of the components had been overheating a lot over the years, so I replaced them with a the donor board, like the bridge rectifiers and so on. So a lot of work was done on this, and it's hard to test it without putting it all back together. So I think now I cleaned the board, which you have to do very carefully, otherwise just a few nanoamps of current will throw this thing off because it is so sensitive, especially around the A to D converter board as well as the as sensitive analog circuits there. Now, in case you want to see underneath that, I think it's fairly similar between these boards. You can see here's our reference over here, and this is all the analog circuitry for the converter, and this is the converter itself, which is based on an Altera FPGA board. That's this one, this board up here from the older revision of this instrument. So I'm going to keep these for parts in the future. A few quick other minor things I forgot to mention. So this is the display that came with this original KT2001. You can see it has a nick at the very top of it. And uh, it, it was okay. I think it's probably going to work fine if, you know, if it's not totally broken because I haven't tested it yet. But I do have the display from the very old unit that I had was trying to repair. It doesn't have that nick. So we could use this. At least the body of it can be used if the VFT display of this one, let's say, is in worse shape, we can certainly do that. But I'm going to use this one initially because I think it just looks a little bit better. So as I was putting the unit back together, it became more and more obvious that this definitely had been totally disassembled before and someone was trying to fix it and obviously gave up. There are screws missing and a couple of broken stuff that I already fixed. Now one thing I recommend for you guys to watch out for is that the plastics that connect the power switches become quite brittle over time. So this is where the power switch is. You can see right through at the bottom, I fixed it with the zip tie. So that breaks right down in there. Now when that breaks, you, you don't want to glue it because if you glue that together, you can never open this unit again because then you need to be able to remove that. So don't glue that, find another way to attach it back together. But it's almost done now. We can finally turn it back on. All right, finally, let's give it a try. There we go. So that's a good sign. So that's the correct model, revision B06. I don't know if that's the latest or not, but here we go. That's not bad. So this is a high impedance input, I believe. So I think the input voltage is going to drift around a little bit. There's nothing connected, of course. So let's try running an internal test because this thing has a full self-test. The buttons work, which is good. Test, built-in self-test, and automatic. Nope, not continuous. Let's see what happens. So it runs through quite an extensive set of internal tests and it compares it with the stored values to see whether they're within range. 
So it passed 100, I think. That's the 300 series test. There's a 400 series test. A lot of clicking of the relays inside. And all tests done. N doesn't seem like it really reported any errors, which is very, very good. That's excellent. So I think we should now connect some inputs to it, see if it actually measures anything correctly or not. So let's do some testing, and what better way to test a QT2001 but against a QT DMM7510. This is a 7.5 digit multimeter as well, which is an evolution of this instrument essentially, and I've done a full teardown and review of this unit. It's a fantastic meter with a lot of different functions in it. So now when we're comparing the two of them, keep in mind that the 2001 absolutely needs to be calibrated again, because we did so much work on it, and I touched the board, and I, even though I cleaned it, we removed and exchanged components, so this definitely needs to be calibrated to be really, really accurate. But this is the original calibration. So let's do a comparison here. I have daisy chained them. Now for a voltage measurement, the voltage enters in here. This input impedance right now is set to 10 mega ohm. This is in the giga ohm, so it doesn't really matter. This connection is accurate enough for our purposes. Let's go ahead and, and try this voltage source here. So I'm going to use one of these boxes that has voltage and current references built in. And again, we don't care about the absolute accuracy here. We just want to compare these two. So I'm going to turn this on. It should be on a 5-volt setting. Let's see what we get. And let's see what we got. There we go. And I would say that is pretty good. I mean, these things are not that far from each other. You can see this is counting a little bit up still. I think that box is going to warm up a little bit more. And yeah, that's pretty close. They're very, very close to each other. So it's almost bang on 5 volts. Yeah, that's pretty good, I would say. For something that we've worked on so much, I, I'm pretty impressed that it has maintained uh, such an accuracy over this, all this abuse it's received. And for completeness, let's do a couple of other measurements. So here's a CRMS measurement, 5 volt again. So that's working, which is quite good. Let's go ahead and measure some resistances. So I have a few resistance standards here. Let's put it into a two-wire resistance measurement. So this is 100 ohms. It's going to read a little bit high because there's cables in the way. There you go, 100 ohm. Pretty good. Let's try 1 kilo ohm. 1 kilo ohm, very good, and 10 kilo ohm, and for 10 kilo ohm, we're also reading very good, and 100 kilo ohm, 100 kilo ohm, yeah, so the ohm range works, AC range seems to work, and the DC of course works, let's measure current, so for DC current we expect 1 milliamp, there's a 1 milliamp reference DC current, beautiful, let's measure the AC current as well, switch this device to AC, we should get about the same amount, there you go, 1 milliamp AC. So that's all the primary functions. I think it looks good. And so there you have it. I hope you enjoyed this video. I finally managed to fix one of these, even though essentially one of them was sacrificed quite a few years ago. I don't necessarily recommend buying these ones broken. They are a big hassle to work on, and to fixing these capacitors are a very common problem. But it's fun if you like to debug a lot of analog circuitry. This one luckily didn't have too many problems, and most of them you could figure out even without turning the unit on, which is not going to happen every time, of course. As always, thanks to the Patreon supporters that makes all of this possible. D do take a look at the page of the Patreon, see if it's something that you're interested to be a part of. And as always, I'll see you in the comment section. Boom.